Hello my dear friends, you are on the military summary channel and today we will discuss the situation in Ukraine on the 24th of October. Today we have some updates, so let's start. If you remember yesterday there were very interesting conversations, uh, to be more precise, four conversations, at least official, between the Minister of Defense of Russian Federation and the Minister of Defense of the Western countries, with the Minister of Defense of the United Kingdom, France, Turkey and the United States of America. And I believe that there was very interesting conversations about the dirty nuclear bomb and about the future of Ukraine. And uh, uh, as a result of those, uh, of those negotiations, the Western countries uh, made it some kind of report uh, about the situation. And I told that all the Russians' uh, concerns about the dirty nuclear weapon is a fake was a fake or is a fake or something like this. But we need to understand that these countries, the Western countries, are not able to provide any other information because we understand that if they confirm these uh, concerns, uh, we can say uh, we can say that the story of Ukraine has been ended as soon as they do this. <coughs> uh, so I if, I, if I give my opinion, I was waiting for today because I understand if, yes, if there were something important yesterday, Today we would see uh, the results. And today, at let's say at 5 p.m. of local time, at 5:13, uh, there was another conversation, but uh, between the chief of general staff of Russian Federation, uh, Gerasimov, and the chief of general staff of United Kingdom, Admiral Radikin. Uh, they finished their conversation somewhere at 5 p.m. And uh, as a result of those conversations, the Russians made another s a short report. These uh, chiefs of general general staff were discussing uh, the situation in Ukraine and the situation with the dirty nuclear bomb. Uh, later, at 6.20 uh, p.m. of local time, the Russians reported that uh, the same person, the chief of general staff, uh, Gerasimov, had conversation with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States of America, uh, with Mark Milley. Uh, they discussed the same question. The same question. You might think, you might think that uh, yesterday, you might think that there were conversations and discussions about Ukraine between very high officers, between Minister of Defense, and today uh, we saw that there were conversations, but between officers of the lower ranks. Uh, I'll give my opinion. This is a very good sign. First of all, we need to understand that yesterday there were conversations between the bosses. So but the one big boss from the Russia, uh, from Russian Federation had conversation with very big bosses from the Western countries and they achieved something and they achieved some agreements. Why I'm saying this? Because today uh, the officers of the lower ranks discussed the same question. And the thing is that if yesterday we saw conversation between bosses, today we saw conversation between the executors. So, I believe that they managed to achieve some agreements, Russian Federation and the Western countries, to be more precise, United States and United Kingdom, because as far as I see, there were no conversations between the Chief of General Staff of Russian Federation with the France partner or the Turkey partner. And uh, these guys, these guys are executors. This is the officers who will be responsible uh, for uh, agreements that bosses achieved yesterday. And now, starting today, uh, they started implementation of those agreements. If we are talking about the front lines, we see that the front lines are stable. This is also the second sign that there were some agreements between them, because the Ukrainians are not starting any offensive operation. The Russians, they are doing mobilization, but they are also um, not starting any counter-offensive operation or something like this. So I believe, I repeat myself, that the negotiation process has started. And maybe this conflict in Ukraine will be freezed during the winter period. Maybe this conflict will be freezed for all. And I hope that we are going to see the freezing of this conflict for, all, for, like, for months or uh, maybe forever. Now let's talk about the front lines. Uh, the front lines, as I told you, are stable. Of course, uh, the Russians reported about some actions from the Ukrainian side all along the front line, and we are going to start with the Kupinsk. 
as you can see the same picture the same towns the same attempts the ukrainians were trying to attack the russians in direction of petrashatravnyva mikolaev karlanska yagidna kislevka they're trying to develop this small back but all their attacks uh, but they were defeated uh, but to tell the truth, the Russians reported that as a result of all these, all those attempts and on this front line, the Ukraine lost just 25 soldiers and nine armored vehicles. So, as we understand, that wasn't like a real, fully blooded counteroffensive operation. Maybe that was some kind of reco in combat, or maybe the Russians provided, uh, I don't know, like regular statistic numbers from the front line. So, as you can see, no progress. Another important updates are coming from Liman, but if we're talking about this area, the Russian source map has been updated, as you can see. Yesterday, the uh, green line, this one, was the current front line, and today, as you can see, the Ukrainians managed to push the gray line a little bit to the east from the gray, from the, uh, green, gray line, from the green line. And all this territory between this line is uh, no longer under Russian control. Uh, this territory is under Ukrainians. Uh, finally, they managed to penetrate a little bit, at least a little bit, the Russian defense orders and moved a little bit to the east. And the most important one that now the, the Ukrainians are able to move their forces uh, to uh, their forces to this forest that located between um, Chernopayevka and, let's say, Zhiribets River. This were important area because from now on, the Ukrainians are able to send their commandos and scouts in direction of this town. And we can say maybe, maybe we are... Uh, we can see the beginning of the uh, north counteroffensive operation and the important thing I, I forget to add about the negotiations. Um, my opinion that all those, uh, that the Rus Russian Federation, the Western countries achieved some agreements, but I believe that it's a very big question and highly unlikely that Ukrainians are going to follow all these negotiations uh, because nobody asked them if they agree with anything. And as you can see, the Ukrainians uh, managed to develop a little bit and now uh, there was like uh, spotted Ukrainian tanks in this area and now the Ukrainians are able to attack or at least to establish fire control over the road that connects Krimina and uh, Svatova, the town, uh, the like the main town, the main fortress, uh, the Russian forces in this area. And they're moving, they're moving slowly, step by step. Uh, today we haven't received any reports that the Russians managed to push the Ukrainian backs. Um, we will discuss the Ukrainian losses a little bit later because uh, it's like ter terrible uh, number we received and we received this number from the Western countries. So, but let's follow next. If we are talking about the front line between uh, Bilogorovka, Seversk, Bakhmut, the front line are stable. The Russians are trying to storm Bakhmut, but we got reports that Ukrainians moved a lot of reinforcement in this area with one purpose to stop the Russians. Because we understand if the countries, if the parties are planning to freeze the front line before the winter, of course, it's important not to lose any town before this negotiation. And of course, it's important to develop as much as possible your position before the freezing. Because let's say if Ukrainians are able to stabilize this situation before, like, before let's say, possible freezing on the, the conflict during the winter period, of course, they will be able to prepare trenches, to prepare fortification, to restore bridges, to, to restore supply. And if uh, during the uh, upcoming spring, the parties are going to uh, restart everything from the beginning. Of course, from this position, the Ukrainians will be have um, their positions are much better than the Russians, and they will be able to cut this line easily, or at least they will have at least such possibility. So that's why it's very important to develop uh, any position before any um, developing or freezing of the conflict. If we're talking about South Donetsk front line, or as we call this area tactical uh, Vremevka bridgehead, uh, I believe that maybe fifth, fifth or sixth time in a row, the Russians included this region uh, in their regular daily report. And today we got another numbers. Um, if you remember during the previous reports the russians reported that ukrainians were trying to do something near vremevka next the next report we got from 
uh, Novy Mikhailovka from this area. And uh, d before that, we had some reports near Pavlovka and Nikolska, this area. And today we got reports from this uh, front line that Ukrainians were trying to develop their offensive operation between towns like Vladimirovka and Salotka. I'm not sure what were they are planning to do, but the losses are saying that Ukraine lost around 25 soldiers, something around six armored vehicles. So that was not a recon combat in this area. They were trying to understand the Russian position, uh, their power, what they're able to do. And as you can see, this uh, this thing is very important because during the previous eight, eight, nine, eight months of this military operation, we were talking about Kharkiv, about Liman, about uh, Severodonetsk, about Kherson. And now we receive almost every single day the reports from this area. So maybe the Ukrainians are trying to understand or they are planning to start, if they are planning to start any counter of offensive operation exactly in this area. Who knows? We haven't received any report from Arekhov Gulaya Polio frontline and this is also a very interesting update because if we are talking about the Russian sources, they reported that Ukrainians managed to collect a lot of forces in this area. At, um, to be more precise, on Arekhov frontline, they have at least two powerful attacks faced one of them. The main direction of one of them is to attack Tokmak Militopol and the second one to, to turn a little bit to the west and move to Energodar. So they have forces, according to the Russian sources the Ukrainians have a lot of forces in this area now we are moving to Kherson district and if we're talking about this area uh, the Russians as we discussed are uh, continue proceeding their evacuation process from Kherson I'm not I don't remember if I told you but the Russians adopted some laws that now they're allowed to now they're allowed and now they're creating territory defense forces in Kherson area and uh, mainly uh, the main part uh, of this uh, uh, Territory defense consists of uh, the locals, of Ukrainians, uh, who decided to stay on this side of the river because a lot of people were moved, evacuated to the left side of the river or to the east bank of the river. And a lot of people stayed in Kherson and the, the sources are saying that around 150,000 uh, civilians still there and a lot of uh, people from this side of the river decided to join this defense forces, this territory defense. And of course, the main factor why these civilians decided to do this is job and salaries, because we understand that there are not much job in this area. The bridges are destroyed, supply are very difficult, and only one way to survive and to stay there and to get some money, to get some food and so on, is to join these territory defense forces. And the, Rus the Russians are not paying a very big salary, but anyway, they're paying a bigger salary than uh, let's say Ukrainian forces received and furthermore at least this money is enough to buy some food to pay for gas to pay for electricity and and to survive in this town during the possible upcoming uh, um, battle for Kherson. If we are talking about the front lines the same uh, direction the same navigation of the Ukrainians uh, we're still trying to attack in direction of Petihatki between this bridgehead and this bridgehead and as a result of those attacks the Ukrainian lost around 80 soldiers and 26 armored vehicles. So as you can see this front line is still, uh, this front line from the Russian side stable but the Ukrainians are um, every day doing new, making new attempts of cracking this area. If we're talking about the global scope, I believe that you've heard about the report that prepared with the Western countries, with the Western organizations. And as a result of those reports, by the 20th of October of, uh, of this year, the Ukrainian losses is around... If you haven't heard this report, I believe that you are able to find this and Google it on the internet. But I'll give you the numbers and these drill numbers and this is the numbers that provided not by the Russian sources, not by the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation. These numbers were provided by the Western companies, West Western organization. The Ukrainian losses is around 400,000 and 2,000 soldiers. 400 and 2,000 soldiers. Imagine yourself. Um, I am doing my, I'm trying to do my own calculations according to the Russian Minister of Defense of Russian Federation. And if we're talking about the uh, previous, uh, I started these calculations since the um, G July. And let's say that by the end of October, the Ukrainian losses is around 70,000 soldiers. So we can say we can add the losses uh, from the Ukrainian side since the beginning of the special operations, since the 24th of February till July. So according to my um, uh, 
according to the numbers from the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation, the real loss of Ukrainian side is maybe a little bit more than 100,000 soldiers, something around 120, 140,000 soldiers. Um, according to the Ukrainians, uh, their, according to their numbers, the losses, the Russian losses is around 64,000 soldiers by this date. So you just twice as less. So according to the Ukrainian sources, the Russians has twice as less losses than the Ukrainians. But today we got reports from the Western countries, Western organizations. They reported that the Ukrainian lost around 4,402,000 4, soldiers. Furthermore, more, more than um, around 390,000 were killed. So from these 402,000, around 390,000 were killed. So they won't be able to return back to the front line. So num the numbers are very big, are very big. And to tell the truth, it's like real genocide of Ukrainian army if we compare with the losses from the Russian side. So it's like uncomparable numbers. Um, and this situation is very... And, and, and the thing is that sooner or later, all these numbers will come will come to the to people and people will find out and if we're talking about the western organizations how did they do the calculation it's like it's not a, a very difficult process because every single town has its own papers where uh, newspapers some sites some organization who public who published information about the killed people and the western organizations uh, according to this um, to these reports calculated the losses and they got this number so the number is terrible and i believe that um, if you're talking about the ukrainians uh, this week they started a uh, conversation about another wave of mobilization so if you remember since the beginning of this special operation the ukrainians managed to mobilize around 1 million army we we know this we know this number uh, this one million army, so we understand that if their losses is around 400,000, so that's mean they lost more than 40%. And if we're talking about the Russians, about their losses, they're very low. They are very low. You can read this the same report. They provided the number from the Russian losses. They are very low in comparison with the Ukrainians. And if the Russians are able to mobilize another 300,000 soldiers, if the Russians are able, let's say, to mobilize some territory defense in these territories, there are some conscripts, there are um, volunteers. So I believe that somewhere in January or in February, the Russians will have bigger army than Ukrainians have. So that's why the Ukrainians pl are planning to start another wave of mobilization. And this is also not cool in this very terrible and difficult winter period for the Ukrainians. So I believe that... Uh, we understand that these guys started this war these guys i'm i'm talking about the these our authorities right and they're not stupid they're smart and they calculated everybody calculated everything uh there is going to talks about this dirty nuclear bomb these talks about the losses from the ukrainian side uh, there are talks about the Russian mobilization, there are talks about the crisis in the Europe, there are talks about a crisis in the uh, United Kingdom with these prime ministers. We, we understand that there is a lot of problems in the United States of America with elections that are going to be on the 8th of November. Everybody understands what a mess is going in, in China with uh, with um, all these things, uh, with the... Um, with the party the ukrainian thing uh, chinese thing so a lot of bad things everybody see about iran who supports with a lot of drones um uh, the russian federation everybody saw the israeli who refused to provide ukrainians any weapon every people see this and understand that this should be stopped because nobody understand what's going to be next and all this situation may blow up and everybody may lose everything and believe me nobody wants to lose his own money no matter Ukraine, no matter losses, nobody wants to lose its own money. It's like, at least, I believe that at least these guys, I'm not talking about the regular people sometimes. It's it, For us, it's, it's not a big deal to lose or to win. But for them who holds the billionaires, I believe they don't want to lose their money. And the conversation talks with the mask, I forgot to add. So a lot of factors, a lot of things are saying that this war should be freezed or for some period of time or stop but the thing is that you know why i'm uh, i'm telling you that zelensky might be the only factor who will not stop this war because you need to understand that the next year is election year for zelensky <clears throat> uh they're going to be the second term and if there is war he are able to 
to, let's say, to make elections as he wants, or at least to, let's say, to freeze them or to cancel election because of, because of the wartime in, in his country. He can do everything he wants. But if, he, um, if the conflict freezes or if any, uh, let's say, peace agreement signs, that means that in three months or in six months, the elections in Ukraine should be held. And I'm not sure that he is going to win the next elections. Because if uh, these parties are going to sign a peace agreement, that means that all these things, losses, killed people, corruption, all these things will go up. And everybody will see the real numbers. So that's why he doesn't want to show the real numbers. He wants to solve this issue and he want, of course, he wants to solve this issue in his favor. He wants to sign, maybe he wants to sign the peace agreement, but he wants to have the second term as a president of Ukraine. But for now, as I see, he doesn't have solution how to do this. And that's it for today. Military Summer Channel reminds me of the many violence in Ukraine. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to my channel. Put your likes, join my Patreon and have a good day. Bye bye.